Hello Grade 12s and welcome to the Answer Series Life Sciences videos based on our study guides. If you don't have our Grade 12 Life Sciences books, Parts 1 and 2, you'll still be able to follow these lessons. This module on evolution forms part of Diversity, Change and Continuity. It forms 44% of Paper 2 in the final exams, so it's a heavyweight topic. There are two sections. Number 1, Evolution by Natural Selection and Number 2, Human Evolution. This video is an overview of evolution by natural selection. So we want to give a bird's eye view of this section, to give a better perspective of what's ahead. It's an overview, so don't expect any detail, don't expect to understand everything. We're just trying to get a better idea of the, all the bits that make up this section. Don't panic, we will cover each section thoroughly in future videos. Something to look forward to. Hold on tight, it's a whirlwind tour. First of all, we'll look at some definition. Origin of ideas about origins, we'll be looking at some definitions in evolution, including hypothesis and theory. What is evolution? Evolution is change over time in anything, bicycles, aeroplanes, chemicals, art, language, whereas biological evolution is looking at change over time in living things. So it's genetic changes that are inherited in populations over time. From simple organisms like viruses, bacteria to the huge diversity of living things that we see on planet Earth. Protozoa, peanuts, pawpaws, pansies and polar bears, the whole lot. This theory proposes an explanation of how one species may give rise to many new species over long periods of time. It does not propose an explanation for the origin of life but the origin of species. There are two types of biological evolution. Macro and microevolution. Macroevolution is big evolution, large scale evolution, change between species over long periods of time. For example, some scientists suggest that one common ancestor, in this case a four legged land living animal, gave rise to hippos and cows and whales over long periods of time. So macroevolution always involves the formation of new species, change between species. We call this formation of new species speciation. Microevolution, on the other hand, involves changes within a species. So it's a smaller scale of evolution, changes over shorter periods of time, and we observe these in the results of scientific investigations. We can also look later in future videos at differences between definitions, for example, hypothesis and a theory. Then we'll look at evidence of evolution. What evidence is there for evolution and we'll be looking at six different evidences. Number one, the fossil record. And in the fossil record only some organisms become fossilized so it's an incomplete record but that is our number one evidence. Number two, we look at descent with modification. This is where a basic body plan or pattern of bones can be modified in different ways to adapt to different environments. So for example, this simple body plan of an upper limb can be adapted in bats for flying. These similarities of body plan suggest a common ancestor. Number three is biogeography, where we look at living things in different places and we are studying the species distribution on Earth. So some plants and animals are similar on different land masses. So scientists suggest that these similar organisms may have a common ancestor if these continents were at one stage one land mass. Number four, we look at genetics as an evidence of evolution. We compare the DNA between species. For example, humans are 60% similar to bananas, 96% similar to chimps. The closer the similarities, the closer the relationship, the more recent the common ancestor. Number five is comparative biochemistry, where we compare the chemicals in different living things. So whether you're an amoeba or an ape or an algae, you have the same chemical structure in your DNA, the same chemical structure of membranes, etc. Number six is vestigial organs. These are known as evolutionary remnants. Darwin considered them useless in modern species, but evidence of structures present in ancestral species. Then we're going to have a look at 
different theories of development. So we'll look at different scientists and their theories, like Lamarck, Darwin, and Gould and Aldridge in their theory of punctuated equilibrium. First of all, Lamarck talked about the desire or the need to develop certain structures or changes. So if a giraffe had to stretch its neck to reach food sources higher up in the trees, these acquired characteristics during its lifetime, like elongated necks, are transferred to offspring. So if you have a tattoo, you could pass it on to your offspring. Darwin, on the other hand, explained evolution in terms of a mechanism called natural selection. Darwin wrote a book called On the Origin of Species. He traveled around the world in a boat called the HMS Beagle, and he studied birds on the Galapagos Islands, as well as many other animals. He proposed that species change very, very slowly over time. We call that speciation to form new species. And these slow changes are known as gradualism. On the other hand, Gould and Aldridge proposed a more recent theory to explain the gaps in the fossil record. They suggest sudden changes to form new species, punctuated, and then long periods of no change, punctuated, equilibrium. Then we'll have a look at the differences between natural selection and artificial selection. So we'll look at the differences and similarities between these two. Natural selection is the mechanism of evolution. So this is where nature determines what are the favorable characteristics. Nature determines which organism will live, which organism will die. On the other hand, artificial selection is where humans determine the desirable traits. Whether it's seedless fruit or cows that produce a lot of milk, breeder or the farmer determines what are the favorable characteristics. Then we'll have a look at variation within a species and we'll look at sources of variation and we'll look at types of variation. You covered this earlier in the year. For example, crossing over in meiosis introduces variation. Mutations in DNA introduces variation. Random fertilization, which sperm gets to which egg, introduces variation. Then we have types of variation. Number one, continuous. Number two, discontinuous. In continuous, we have a continuous range of values. For example, these organisms can be any length, no gaps. Discontinuous, on the other hand, is where the organisms are in categories. They can either be striped in pattern or checked or solid. So we indicate this with gaps between the data. Then we have a look at formation of new species. And species may be formed, for example, by isolation geographically. So species may be separated geographically. So if we have a look at an example of a population, it may be separated. These mountain peaks may form barriers between the different groups and we may eventually get new species forming. It could be valleys or bodies of water or deserts or mountains. If these populations don't meet, they don't mate, they become separate. Then we have a look at something called reproductive isolation. Reproductive isolation is where populations are prevented from exchanging genes and it makes sure that species remain separate. So we look at different mechanisms and forms. For example, species can remain separate because they breed at different times. Whether they breed at different times of the year, seasonal isolation, or whether they breed at different times of a 24-hour period. If they don't meet, they don't mate, they become separate. Species can also remain separate by having specific courtship. So animals can make sure that they only attract and mate with members of the same species by having very specific signals like mating calls or feather displays or color displays that are only recognized by the same species. Plants also have ways of making sure that they keep a certain species. So they are adapted to particular pollinators. They may have specific structures that are adapted for a particular pollinator and ensure that pollination only occurs between the same species only. Other animals can prevent fertilization, whether their reproductive organs are not compatible or they don't match each other or the gametes just can't fuse for some other reason. Another way 
that species can remain separate is by occupying different habitats. So for example, the bald eagle and the fish eagle live in the same area, but they occupy different niches or they have different roles. So they don't meet, they don't mate, they become separate. Some species are able to mate, they are able to produce offspring, and we call these offsprings hybrids. For example, the horse can mate with a donkey and they produce a mule, but it's infertile. So another infertile hybrid is a zonkey or a liger. Those are other examples. Then lastly, we'll have a look at evolution in present times. So we can see insects developing resistance to insecticides. We can see bacteria developing resistance to antibiotics. HIV viruses developing resistance to antiretrovirals and the Galapagos finches showing variation in beak and body size. So for example in insects, some insects may have a random mutation that makes them resistant to a particular insecticide like DDT. These mutations or mutated forms survive, they multiply, they pass on the gene and eventually we get a population that is resistant to the insecticide. Bacteria can also develop a mutation that makes it resistant to a particular antibiotic. They survive, they multiply, and eventually you can get an entire population that is resistant to a particular antibiotic. Viruses, over time, can develop a mutation that makes them resistant to a particular drug. Over time, they multiply in the population, and eventually we need a cocktail of drugs to be able to deal with these drug-resistant viruses. Darwin also found variation in the beak and body size in the Galapagos finches. So a bird with a beneficial or a favorable characteristic, like a big beak or a larger body, survives, reproduces, passes on the favorable tray, and this is an example of modern day evolution in finch species. And that's it for our overview for this section. Thank you for listening, Grade 12s. We hope you have a better idea of the content that will be covered in the videos to follow on evolution by natural selection. Thank you and bye.